Welcome to the What If Podcast with your hosts, Spencer Worth Davis and Ryan Copperood. We have been, we have been, we have, we have been, we have been, we have, we have been, we have been, we have, we have been hoodwinked. Heck. We have been, we have been, we have, we have been, we have been, we have, we have been, we have been, we have, we have been hoodwinked. Heck. Nailed it. If you don't know the podcast, better hit the Google. We have been hoodwinked, maybe bamboozled. Bars. Oh, bars. Bars. Steve, Steve, Stephen A. Smith bars. What's up, bruh? Hey, man. You want to talk about some aliens? Uh, That's how I'm starting every show from now on. <laughs> it's actually applicable today. I love it. It is. It's very applicable. I mean, it's. It's. It, I don't think it's ever not applicable. We probably always talk about aliens anytime we pitch aliens. We would never... We would never lead you all astray in that way, in such a way. We will never, never ever bamboozle y'all. <laughs> Not once will you be bamboozled on the podcast. Spencer, it's it's uh, it's winter here in Minnesota. Spencer left his microphone outside. Uh, I dared him to touch his tongue to it. <laughs> we have been hurting. Bamboozled. He's going to do the whole episode. Just with- end up sounding like Barney Gumble. <laughs> a cr- we have been bamboozled. <laughs> that was Pee Wee Herman. Damn it. Sorry, Jose. <laughs> I didn't know I could do. I didn't know I could do pee with you. That's a that's a oh, wow. good development. Wow. Everything has changed. I love that. I love that. In your <laughs> attempt. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. In your attempts to do an impression of someone else, you learned you can do an impression. Pee Wee Herman impression. Pee Wee Herman. Yeah. Dude, why we not? need some Pee Wee Herman sounders asap. Ooh, that's yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> Even just that laugh. Did. Pee Wee Herman get in trouble for being a being a weirdo. Yeah, he was he was showing at who's boss in a movie theater. Oh, yeah. womp, 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 womp. I mean, maybe he didn't. It was like pre-internet. Maybe I don't know what happened. All right. Well, he was lonely. Well, we'll try to only have sounders from. <laughs> now nah, we've already failed at that, haven't yeah. we? <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, we're talking about disclosure. Well. Do, do yeah, we actually know the wait, not the movie? Do we know the uh, or the project or, or the, the project. doctor with the or, yeah, that one. <laughs> He's a medical doctor. Do you know that? We don't. We don't say. We don't say his name. He's like Voldemort <laughs> around here. We don't say his name. He who shall not be named. Tight shirt, doctor who shall be named. <laughs> um, do we actually know the episode title ahead of time today? Do we settle on one? We did. What if the U.S. government believes in aliens? Yeah. Because so we don't. I guess this is sort of a, a new thing for us. No, I shouldn't say new thing. We talk about aliens all the time. Uh, what? <laughs> you don't say. If you're here and this is new to you, oh boy. Um, but Have we, don't we usually... got 60 back episodes for you? <laughs> I'm loving it. We actually, we had a bunch of people hit up the show this week and be like, Hey, I just discovered you guys three weeks ago. And I was like, Oh boy, you have a treasure trove of weird bullshit to go through. Mostly bullshit. (laughs) At least it'll make you laugh. The weird bullshit or God, I hope so. Um, (laughs) yeah, we, but for the most part, I guess for our 60 episode back catalog that everyone, uh, you, you all can go through. We don't do a ton of current event stuff. Uh, mostly we're telling stories that are kind of, around the you know the time but we go all the way way back into history and we go forward into the future and everything in between but we don't do a lot of hey this week this happened but now we record less than 24 hours before we put these out well there's kind of that and also uh and also we've got i would say we 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 talked about off air we probably one of the bigger uh current events disclosure stories the, of our lifetimes that is extremely on brand <laughs> for <laughs> oh god sorry I'm trying to find Pee Wee Herman Saunders <laughs> that one's horrible that sounds yeah, like that it got was, ran that through was a painful. soup can uh, mine was definitely better um, yeah for sure you should just go back and get yours out of the sound clip <laughs> and put it back on the board don't worry I can do it again maybe uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably end up as a totally different impression by the end of the show <laughs> <laughs> just go back to doing Hacksaw Jim Duggan <laughs> <laughs> or just just turns into Ric Flair woos somehow. <laughs> Woohoo! That's Mario. I know. I was going that way too. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> um, anyway, on Saturday we haven't there was had a, the Ouija on the board in a while either. Yeah, well, you know, on Saturday there was a New York Times article written by Helen Cooper, Ralph Blue, Blumenthal. Is that how you say that? Blumenthal and Leslie Keen. Uh huh. About how our government has been researching UFOs for the last uh, at least 10 years or so. Yeah. How about that, guys? And throwing a bunch of money at it. 
Yeah. So the the article I'm sure most of you guys heard about over the weekend or sometime between Saturday and now. And also the article that spawned. Yeah, it's been many, many, many. other places. We'll get to a bunch of the other then. ones. But the original one was the New York Times on this past Saturday, December 16th of 2017. And it's titled Glowing, Glowing Auras and Black Money, the Pentagon's Mysterious UFO Program. Mm-hmm. And in addition to a bunch of information about something called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. At, at tip, at tip, at a tip. They also posted a video taken by, I believe it was an F-18 fighter jet that saw a UFO and recorded about a minute, eh, just under a minute worth of video along with two pilots talking about what they're seeing. And oh, that, they, I don't even know how to describe it. It looks almost like umbrella-shaped UFO that's flying at a pretty high speed, it looks like, and makes some kind of odd maneuvers and turns. And the pilots seem very spooked about what it might be. And that video is different from the other video that came out along with this disclosure, right? Which was the one from the USS Nimitz Mm, I don't know. From the 2004 event? I, I don't know what you're talking about right now. Okay, so there was a second follow-up article in the New York Times where related to the disclosures that were made in that article that Spencer just referenced, there was another article written by Helene Cooper, Leslie Keen, and Ralph Blumenthal titled two Navy airmen and an object that quote accelerated like nothing I've ever seen. And essentially what they did was as part of their investigation into this program, went and talked to a couple of the people who were, uh, who basically had been, uh, I don't know what the, what the right word is, but uh, di- digested through the program because of an incident that happened to them. When I'll, I'll actually tell the full story in a little bit here. Cause it's, pretty interesting but we should probably go back to the program and talk a little bit more about the program itself and then we'll and then we'll get into some of the stories that have come out yeah so i guess there are two videos that depict a pretty similar looking thing yeah unidentified aerial phenomenon yes so yeah the the pentagon uh, admitted publicly or declassified information about a program called the advanced aviation threat identification program which ran officially from 2007 until 2012 and had a total budget across those five years of $22 million in, quote, black money, meaning it wasn't officially part of the U.S. budget. And their goal was to research UFOs and unidentified aerial phenomenon. Yeah, the the disclosure uh, told us it was a pet project of Nevada Senator Harry Reid, who had been in the Senate for 30-ish years until he retired last year. Something like that. Um, and Harry Reid was basically this, he, he's been a big proponent or I guess a, a curious member of, of society who, who wanted to do some investigation of this phenomena and, um, and basically threw his support behind getting a program like this going at the Department of Defense. And his entry point to this curiosity with UFOs and unexplained paranormal possibly stuff was actually Robert Bigelow, who we've talked about extensively on the show, but mostly on our episode about or episodes about Skinwalker Ranch. Ja, 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 the plot thickens. And most, if not all, of that $22 million went to Robert Bigelow and Bigelow Aerospace in order to study this phenomena further And some of that study may have taken place at Skinwalker Ranch and Harry Reid and a, another, uh, defense intelligence agency actually visited Skinwalker Ranch Mm -hmm. with Bigelow prior to starting this program. Yeah. If, uh, if you haven't listened, everything is connected. It's all connected. The conspiracy is real. Heck. Uh, if you didn't listen to the Skinwalker Ranch episodes, you should because they're super weird and super fun and we talk about things like basquatch ball and there's just a lot of crazy information about skinwalker ranch to be found in yeah. books or on podcasts or totally. on the internet or yeah if, um, if you're not familiar with that story somehow go familiarize yourself go familiarize yourself for sure it's a good time um but on but on our our two-parter that we did about skinwalker we talk about how um how bigelow got connected to the whole skinwalker ranch and that uh he's 
basically like a real estate magnet uh, out of Vegas, hence the Nevada connection to Harry Reid, etc. Um, yes. And uh, some of you might remember Bob Bigelow, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby Biggs from this spring when he was on... Bobby Bigfoot. Bobby Bigfoot. <laughs> um, Bobby Bigfoot. Was he on CBS? Was it 60 Minutes? It was... Oh, yeah, talking it, about how aliens are definitely real and yeah. they've been here and so on and so forth. Like... That was a few years ago, wasn't it? No, that was this year. Really? It was this spring. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, shit. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Shows like what I know. six or seven months ago. Okay. But he was... Uh, not not just defending that the fact that aliens were real, but like adamantly defending the yeah, fact like he that he was offended that that was even a question. Yeah. It sounded like yeah. she's like the the female reporter says something to the effect of, are, are, "Do you believe that we've been visited?" And he like cuts her off. He's like, "Oh, there's no doubt in my mind." He just jumps in on her instantly. Why is she? What? Yeah. What do you mean? You said female reporter like that. Meant well, I, no, it was because it was because I was gonna do a like an, a girl impression, and then I realized that was just not a good idea, and then I just said female reporter. Gotcha. Said. He was being interviewed by Pee Wee. <laughs> 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 it sounded like a drunk Bigfoot <laughs> slash Barney Gumbel. Uh, yeah, there you go. So yeah, they, Robert Bigelow was involved, and in the towards the end of that first New York Times article, it says that Robert Bigelow is in possession of materials recovered from what they call unidentified aerial phenomena. Yeah. So Bobby Bigfoot has pieces of UFOs somewhere in a warehouse in Vegas and, is basically what this article said. Yeah, and we and we kind of just let that be. Nobody That was a footnote in this fucking article. Yeah, nobody was like, "Excuse me, you have what?" And I think they said that they're trying to or implied that they're trying to reverse engineer and figure out what they do. Completely. Yeah, there's a quote from Harold Putoff, who we'll talk more about him and his affiliations later. But the quote from him in the article is, we're sort of in the position of what would happen if you gave Leonardo da Vinci a garage door opener. First of all, Hal, (laughs) calm down. You're not da Vinci. (laughs) Secondly, he he goes on to say... He'd try and figure it out. He'd try and figure out what this plastic stuff is. He wouldn't know anything about the electromagnetic signals involved or its function. So he's implying that they have materials and or technology from some sort of advanced civilization, possibly extraterrestrial, and they're trying to reverse engineer it and figure out what it does and if they can replicate it, which sounds a lot like what we talked about Bob Lazar doing. Was that... Two, last week, two weeks ago? In our Area 51 Whenever episode. We did Area 50, was that yeah, last week? Co- I don't even remember. A couple weeks, I don't Whatever. know. This, In our Area 51 episode, when we talked about... It all blends together. Bob Lazar. Um, yeah, man. And yeah, you're right. Like, that sentence was totally kind of like a, a footnote or or not a super... Hey, uh, we might actually have materials from an alien craft in right. a warehouse. I would have led with that instead of we have fo- we have a... 30 second video of what the pilots even are saying is a effing drone, according to the New York Times. Or one of them said, yeah, the there's a the, the, the other, video starts with you, it's a fucking drone, bro. The, is the first thing said in the video. Yeah, the the other video is more interesting, and that's the story that we'll actually tell the 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 entirety of. But you're saying that was their lead for the whole thing yeah. instead of like, yeah, Bob has a UFO in his garage. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> also, the Politico article had the sentence, the revelation of the program could this is from the actual uh sorry, I'm reading directly from the Politico article that came out almost at the same time as the New York Times article. So a couple of people must have gotten the the lead on this. Well, we'll we'll get to that. We too. will we will get to that too. Yeah, there's a there's a lot to untangle here. We'll be we'll be in it for a minute. Um the revelation of the program could give a credibility boost to UFO theorists who have long pointed to public accounts by military pilots and others describing phenomena that defy obvious explanation and could fuel demands for increased transparency about the scope and findings of the Pentagon effort, which focused some of its inquiries into sci-fi sounding concepts like wormholes and warp drives. Yeah. And and those are real words used in some of the declassified documents around this well, program. Yes. I... I'm going to say this might be a good time to point out that as exciting as a lot of this stuff sounds, I'm also very skeptical of it because of its source. Well, so let's talk about the more credible source before we talk about the less credible source. It's hard to separate them, but go for it. So Lou 
Elizondo is a man who is... Uh, <laughs> I am a man. I am a man <laughs> who is uh, confirmed by, I mean, public record, et cetera, as, uh, as the director of the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program. And he resigned... In with, October yeah. of this year. Yep. Over... He had concerns about the secrecy and if it was really necessary to be as secretive as they were being about all this information. Partially, I believe, because he felt that they needed both more funding and more attention put on the subject. Right. So he was looking to potentially spread some of the documentation they had, the videos, the testimonies, etc., so that they could get more money to continue to investigate the phenomenon because he believes in it pretty thoroughly and the government's take as as it usually is when presented with weird unexplainable shit is nothing to see here we should close this up what weird unexplainable shit right um and so then they'll keep looking at it in a different format and right make that secretive and i was saying and even more secretive and quiet um but uh so lou elizondo was the director of this program i believe from the from its entirety from 2007 to 2012 yeah at the dod okay real quick yep there are many contradictions and confusing pieces of this oh the the whole thing is messy so he resigned in october of the program ended in 2012 yeah, but I believe this. What sto- happened for the five years in between? I believe the story is that he made a lateral move inside of the DOD at the time that it was officially unfunded and then continued to say, we were doing a good thing, we were doing a good thing, and after he felt like he had exhausted all roads of, hey, I want people to know about this, he said, fuck it, I'm out of here. So what was he doing? what was his job or what was his title during those five years in between? I don't know. I don't think they said, or I haven't seen it in any of the articles I've read so far because it seems like another case of no, no, this, this totally stopped. We didn't, we didn't keep doing this when in reality it just got shifted somewhere else and renamed. Oh, completely. And all the money is off the books anyway. So you couldn't trace it if you wanted to. My favorite was one of the articles completely. One of my favorites was one of the articles said, uh, that they asked one of the Reuters reporters directly sent to uh, the Pentagon Mm -hmm. for comment on whether or not the program was still running saying, Hey, you know, sometimes things get unfunded, but that doesn't mean the programs necessarily die or no new funding comes from another source, et cetera. And the Pentagon spokeswoman, uh, Laura Ochoa said, quote, the defense department takes seriously all threats and potential threats to our people, our assets and our mission and takes action whenever credible information is developed. So, Which sounds like a super not answer. Like, yeah, we're totally still doing this shit, but shut the fuck up. <laughs> Leave right. us alone. Oh, hi. Thanks for checking in. I'm <laughs> still a piece of garbage. Um, because even within this topic, you can go back to like Project Blue Book was the first big. Well, Project yeah, Blue- how deep into that do you want to get? Well, I mean, just we can get into it deeper later, but yeah. for now, like Project Blue Book. If you're familiar with the UFO topic at all, you've probably heard of it. It was the Air Force, the U.S. Air Force's official investigation into UFOs that lasted or ran from '52 to 1969. Yeah, yeah. But before that, there were two precursors that were basically the same project, just under different names. Right. So there was what was it? A uh, Sign Project Sign and Project Grudge. Mm-hmm. Sign ran from '47 to '49. They're like, nope, we're done. Nothing <laughs> happened. <laughs> then immediately from 49 to 51, Project Grudge happened. And then they're like... And someone we're... said, someone said, what's Project Grudge? And they said, nothing, it's over now. <laughs> yeah. And then in 1952, Project Blue Book was started and ran officially until 1969. Right. When the government said, yeah, we looked at all of it, nothing to see here. And so... Then there's this gap from 70 until 07. Which makes me believe we just don't know the names of whatever the project exactly. turned into over the just entire like, time. We don't know what it was from 2012 until 2017. Right. It seems like, honestly, this has been studied officially by the government since at least the 40s. Nonstop. Probably without break. Probably. Yeah. Or, or, or if with break, with less break time than they were actually studying it for. Yeah, and then if you're going to stop, why pick it up again? You know, like yeah, if, for sure. If, if there was any truth to the, yeah, we looked at it and there's nothing to see here and it's not a threat, then why would you pick it up 30 years later, 40 years later, 50 years later? Totally. 
Well, and what's other, changed? Yeah. The other thing, so I think I always think a couple different things about this. The one thing I think first is are they is is this a good way to excuse black budget dollars? One. Because if you continue to create twenty two million is so, is so paltry little. in the form of the DOD budget. Yeah, that's true. You're right. The, the defense budget for this this current year or past year, twenty seventeen, like whenever you're listening to this. Sixty billion dollars or something. Five hundred and thirty eight billion. Yikes. No, five I wrote that. Five five eighty three, sorry. Five hundred and eighty three billion dollars. And they spent twenty two million. That's like a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of right. a percent. It's almost nothing. In fact, you know what? The, that was another weird thing that I thought about. In five years, if you spend twenty-two million dollars, right? You're let's say four and a half a year. Yeah, you're spending four million dollars a year. Even like, I would say the conservative end of a DOD employee is probably like a flat hundred grand, maybe or something like that. You're all you know retired sure. Navy or whatever. But that, military all officials. they did was give. They just wrote a twenty-two million dollar check to Bigelow. Basically, is what it sounds like. Right. Exactly. So then said, "Here's five years of." Go do shit at Skinwalker. It's and, honestly sort of what it sounded like. And, or we'll email you weird photos and video when we find them and yeah. you can tell us what it is. And Lou in the Pentagon with maybe a small team or something like that. So yeah, I mean, all things considered, yeah, I guess it's it couldn't be that because it's not really it's not really enough money to to be creating, you know, a cover story for money. But again, if no, I, I don't think so. But <clears throat> it does seem possible that maybe the opposite happened and there was much more money being funneled into this because Again, what are you really going to do with $22 million over five years when your research, you know, any one of the aircraft you're looking at costs more than $22 million. Right. You're not, you're not reverse engineering anything for, for, million for $4 dollars. million dollars a year. Well, and that's the other thing that we've talked about on this show countless times now, but we always say something to the effect of, if this is what we know, right? I mean, that's what I'm saying. if I, this is what we know, what do we not know about these these types of programs or similar programs or extensions of these programs or whatever. And if that money was entirely off the books anyway, we're just trusting them that that number is correct. There's no way to check that. Oh yeah, for sure. So it could have been a lot more. It could have been a yeah. lot less. It could have been exactly that. Like there's no right. way to know any of that. Lou was like, Hey, I'm going to leak the information that I directed this program for five years. And they're like, okay, cool. Can you just lie a little bit about the fact that we didn't give you $200 billion to do it? We gave you whatever. Right. Well, and <sighs> I just, I, I wonder where, okay, so this information was declassified by the Pentagon. Is that how it became public? Um, and then to the stars, which I guess we should probably transition to now. Well, so Lou, let's finish just Lou really quickly. Oh, yeah, so yeah. so Lou, Lou apparently worked on it from 07 to 12, then some lateral move or existed somewhere in the Pentagon, potentially on another version of this until October of this year. We don't really know. Then sends a public resignation letter in October about the program and about his works there and said, I'm not comfortable. He sent it to Mattis, didn't he? General Mattis, I think, is who got it. He sent it to General Mattis announcing his resignation because he felt it deserved more, less secrecy, more time, more money, more attention. He leaves the Pentagon in October and less than two months after he leaves, joins to the stars. Right. Which is... (laughs) Yeah, messy. <laughs> messy. <laughs> to, to the stars and to the stars Academ- Academy of Arts and Sciences, I think is the total, the pick full a, title. Pick an easier name, guys. Pick an is easier a name. company uh, that was started by former Blink-182 member and I believe founder of Blink-182, Tom DeLong. Who, again, if you're into the whole UFO thing, you've probably heard of or heard from him at some point. And we should have got some Blink One Eighty Two Sounders. <laughs> to, no. <laughs> yes, of course. Just Jai Pumps. Oh, wrong. You, mean, you mean like the actual band? Keep the, yeah. Of oh no, no, nah, fuck that. I, I'd play some Tom DeLong. Well, I had a secret meeting, but I can't talk about it. Sounders, if you want. All right, we'll do that. On, we'll we'll pull. Well, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> well, I don't want to get into that. We'll pull them on the break. So, to the Stars Academy of arts and sciences is a company founded by Tom DeLong and a bunch of other people. And they, it's really hard. I spent entirely too much time with this today. I spent several hours listening to Tom DeLong interviews. I watched their whole live stream of their launch event, dug through their website, tried to find out as much as I could about them and sort of have like a half 
half-baked concept of what it is they're doing. But they're focusing on three seemingly unrelated areas, which are aerospace, entertainment, and just, quote, science. They don't get very specific. Wait, what was the first one? Aerospace. Aerospace. So that one makes sense. We're Not talking- science. Aerospace. Right. And, mm. Well, in like aerospace engineering, I think is what they mean. Like, yeah. one of the things they want to do is they're designing a spaceship. Let's go. That he sometimes calls a time machine. Yeah, he he does this frequently. <laughs> he in one of the interviews that I watched of him, he talks about. Yeah, you just get into this ball of light, and then you're in China in like a minute, <sighs> dude. He, it's like a time machine. I'm like, no, I don't think that's how time machines work. Bro. I watched his interview with Joe Rogan today. He was on the Joe Rogan podcast a couple, like I don't know, maybe a month or two ago. Did it hurt your head? Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> but what for a variety of reasons. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the things he talks about is this craft that they're developing. And that seems to be the main focus of this aerospace arm of the company is they, they're developing some sort of craft. And if you go to their website, which I think it's just to the stars.com or to the stars academy.com. Uh, they have to the stars dot media, which is all of their shops. And then okay. I don't know. It's confusing. yeah. So they have this three prong thing and we'll, we'll get to the other parts in a second, yeah, but yeah. they're building according to him, quote, an exotic, Exotic craft with an energy source that can revolutionize the world. It's a theme with Tom and this company that they're just sort of very mm. grandiose ways of saying nothing that happen a lot. Yeah. But but it but it's it's apparently some sort of craft that's based on I'm assuming recovered ET craft that they've somehow reverse engineered. <laughs> yeah, I and <laughs> He shows on the, on the, going back to the Joe Rogan interview, he has him pull up this YouTube video of what he claims is basically the ship that they're building, but that there's like a smaller version that the government developed at some point. And he pulls up, he has him pull up this video. It's the, uh, oh man, let me see if I can find it. But it's this just horrifically fake CGI video is it just like a comp video they made as a way to No, it's uh okay, so if you if you search YouTube for Astra A S T R A T R three B, that's what he says this craft is. And the second one down <laughs> that it's sounds like, like a, the most made up fucking Star Wars. Yeah. C three PO derp 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 derp. It's uh it's a one minute video, it's the second one down, and it's it's, it's this triangle shaped UFO looking thing that kinda flies around and it's blurry and the camera's moving and it's like got this green night vision tint to it. And then it just turns into a white circle on, on the frame. And then the whole frame goes white for a second and then it's gone. And he's saying that that's it using this warp drive, bending time, space time, time travel thing that they're going to develop. But it's so, I, I I don't know. Maybe I'm not a, a CGI or film expert, but goddamn if it doesn't look fake. And also, so that's out there already, but you guys are spending millions of dollars to develop it because it's on YouTube? Like, what is... Their strategy just never quite makes sense to me. So in addition to this aerospace thing, which is, I guess, they're building a UFO that can time travel, they're making... <laughs> he has this media... Are you watching the video? Dude. Yeah, it's it's silly. It's just like... We'll put a link to it in, just, the, in the like, notes. It's a triangle that's on the screen for a long time, and then it turns bright, and it goes yes. off the screen. Yes. Uh, <sighs> there's this media arm of the company that, if you heard about, he released a book last year called Secret Machines. That was sort of the first offering from this media uh, arm of the company. They're producing a movie and some TV shows, but it's all fictional stuff. And I think his logic is that film and books, and I, I think they're making music too, is the best way to, to reach website. the largest number of people and to get them interested in these topics. And although the stories are technically fiction, the underlying elements are true and based in fact. And therefore people will see it in a fictional setting, but get interested in the actual things. Which goes along with a lot of both information and disinformation stuff that we've talked about in the past too, which is use Hollywood to leak out series of things about things, then the 
public familiarizes themselves with the concepts, it makes it easier when the concepts are real and not fake. So those, those two, I can't, I don't really get it. And I don't necessarily agree with that model, but at least I kind of understand what they're trying to do. The scientific exploration arm, I really don't get at all. And they don't talk about it much in any of the videos I watched. And on their website, as far as they elaborate, it just says scientific exploration. And then they have bullet points. <laughs> the first one is consciousness. Not science. Well, maybe. Then, or er, sorry, not wait. That's under that's under science. Oh, sorry, I thought that was the aerospace one. I was no. like, consciousness not in space. Well, it might be actually. Okay, we don't right. really know. All right, consciousness, engineering space time, brain computer interface, telepathy, yeah, and an analysis center for UAPs, as in unidentified aerial phenomena. Cool. That's the science that they're going to be doing. Sure. Does Tom DeLong. And a bunch of other people, including uh, Lou, Lou, or is it Louis? Lou, uh, L-O-U-I-S, so it's Louis, Louis, but he Lou, goes by Lou, yeah. Okay. Lou Elizondo, who we talked about earlier. Jim Semivan, who claims he was a spy for the CIA for a long time, but if you watch his bio video on the website, it sounds like a guy who was told about 30 seconds before they started filming, hey, be a spy. Cool. Describe what it's like to be a spy. Cool. I really want to watch it right this very minute. So he goes, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up. I have I, I link to it because the audio is, yeah, let's let's listen. My name is Jim Semivan. I'm a retired CIA officer. I worked as a spy for 25 years in the CIA's clandestine service. Had a wonderful career there. Enjoyed it very, very much. Was lucky enough to be a member of the Senior Intelligence Service. I currently consult with the intelligence community uh, on a part-time basis. I was born and raised in Ohio. Uh, I went to school at Ohio State. Got a couple undergraduate degrees. Uh, left and uh, eventually went to uh, San Francisco where I Got a master's degree in English literature at San Francisco State University. Uh, working at the Central Intelligence Agency is a unique experience. Uh, you get in and you're, you're very highly trained. You're working with a, a group of people that are uh, usually uh, very, very smart. Um, they tend to be very, very bright and from any number of areas. You can have somebody working next to you with a PhD in French literature, uh, the young woman working the, on, on the other side of you has a master's degree uh, um, in business or perhaps a, a law degree. In the clandestine service, you're training to be a spy. It's a lot of work. It can be a lot, of, a lot of pressure, particularly when you're starting out, because you're with a group of people that generally tend to be highly, highly motivated. And uh, so you have to sort of keep up with everybody. It's a lot of fun. Uh, they do train you very, very well. Uh, working as a as a spy is always interesting. Uh, it's somebody once described it as ninety five percent boredom and five percent sheer terror, and I think that's pretty much accurate. I think that's enough of Jim. <laughs> it's fun. They uh, they trained us and stuff, and uh, there were other spies too. And uh, somebody said this about being a spy once, so I'm going to repeat that, and maybe that's right. I love the incredible platitudes with which he speaks. Like, people are very smart. <laughs> it is very hard. Dude, you, got, like, you have to be very bright. Fam, how did you get a master's in literature and still have that third grade <laughs> vocabulary? Maybe, I had a nice <laughs> career. Maybe maybe he was scared he was going to say something classified, so he just was speaking in platitudes I don't the get entire into that. time. I can't tell you about he can't, that. He, he can't tell you about that. So that's the guy who's going to do spy stuff for them? So the, <laughs> the <laughs> thing about this whole thing <laughs> is that it's weird. It's super weird. It's weird because, okay, so... What and we, Tom DeLong just doesn't seem like he's okay. Well, you know that's been, I mean... I, that, I don't really know anything about him, but just... Mark like Hoppus he's, he's in the really band. Uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable to look at and listen to him for any amount of time. He just doesn't seem like he's all there. I, he seems like really nervous and fidgety, and he never. He kind of talks in circles a lot. He'll, he says yeah. a lot without ever really saying anything. I'm not trying to be whatever, but those are also all potentially symptoms of people who are on drugs, right? 
I don't, I mean, I'm not going to yes. necessarily if, suggest if I, that. But if I met a person who was doing all those speaking things, speaking and acting the way that he does, I would assume that. Sure. And I remember Mark Hoppus, even I think on Twitter at some point, was saying that Tom needed some help. And his response, it, because it, going to that Joe Rogan episode, if you, if you can stomach it, for an hour and 40 minutes it's it's pretty entertaining I, I can only get, i can get down with joe every once in a while yeah i mean and, and joe doesn't take anything that he's saying too seriously and really presses him on on some of the stuff that's good that he's saying yeah i'm sure that's very very well earned but he asks him at one point you know are you worried about or what do you what do you say to people who think that you're crazy and all he says is well they don't know what i know cute like that that's a great way for people to think that think you're, you're crazy. super crazy yeah. yeah because you it's can't it's all in my head joe i know it all right and he he's not providing any evidence of any of the things that he's talking about right. and he's a classic like will believe does believe in every single conspiracy theory right and there's no way that they're all true tom like even you, you kind of got to pick one or two if you're going to have any credibility because right. in the course of an hour and 40 minutes, you told me that the moon landings were faked, <laughs> that there are also moon bases, that there are structures on Mars, that dinosaurs and humans lived at the same time. Mm. And, you know, and, and that aliens are also visiting earth frequently right? and that you can, uh, there are types of radiation that if you blast them at metals create, uh, like anti gravity, you know, he's just like he's on the the free energy and the ancient aliens and the yeah, the, just all these different conspiracy theories, right? And yet, he's got all these people working for his company that are legitimate. Uh, at or, least some of them are right. some uh, some more than others. Jim Semivan, not quite a minivan, not the, yet. The <laughs> best good spy that ever spied. <laughs> I'm Jim. <laughs> Spying was hard, but fun. <laughs> I had a nice career. Spies with, are smart. <laughs> with smart people. Spies like me know how to spy real good. I'm Jim. Nobody cares. <laughs> but Shut then, your dumb ass up, Jim. <laughs> but then... Tell me who you killed, Jim. <laughs> he's got some... <laughs> He's got some people who seem like they might actually have done the things they're talking about and be intelligent people with actual working knowledge of things and right and i don't know like is this just a paycheck for them because they're crowdfunding millions of dollars and which they did they've crowdfunded with 2200 donors something like two and a half million dollars so far to fund all of their efforts and i'm sure delong has a ton of his own money at this point and and, and part of yeah totally i mean Blink-182 has made, I'm sure he's got $50 million in the bank, if not more. And he's he has done to have made tons of millions like, of dollars. On the media side of things, it has been working. Like, Secret Machines sold a bunch of copies, and well, he's, and the weird part uh, obviously about, the, the PR side of things is working. He's, yeah. He was featured, or they were featured in every every possible publication over the weekend, and he's right. been on every radio show and a bunch of TV shows. Right. And, and on their website, so part of what additionally makes it messy is... They're trying. They're saying, okay, we we do we do science and aerospace engineering, but also we do entertainment. And when you go to to the stars media, which is the entertainment mini site inside of the to the, to the stars web presence, the first thing you see is buy buy a guitar strap and get free Ernie Ball guitar strings. And you're like, what the what the what the fuck. What the right. fuck? I mean, like, I right. get that you're Tom DeLong and you are a musician and also invested in this stuff, but it totally muddies the who the fuck are you and what are you here for mm -hmm. if you're using all of this fucking bullshit. We can we can build warp drives and radiation and all the shit, and then on your website you're like, buy our guitar straps, buy Angels and Airways vinyl, buy the Lonely Astronaut books that Tom wrote, buy Secret Machines, buy... Like, there's all this shit to buy on his website that's sort of related to some of like the concepts, but none of it is actually well, really directly related to the mission. So then you're like, are you just, are you just going on every publication you possibly can and stirring up as much bullshit as you possibly can? Because every time you do, you sell $25,000 worth of merch in a day the, on the, your website. The first interview that I listened to with him, he says right away that their, their main goal is to be a perpetual fundraising machine. 
Because with, and, with and money comes power, and you can well, do and, shit. And, and his explanation of that is, we need a lot of money to develop quality content and to develop this crazy UFO time machine thing that we're right. making and to make right. these huge strides that we want to make. Like, yeah, if you really are developing some sort of super advanced aircraft, that's going to cost many millions of dollars. But I don't think you are. Well... So I think that's a great segue because we're we're going to take a quick break here but Lou Lou being a part of this is what continues to make this messy because the videos that got released this week came with some pretty interesting stories from the Helene Cooper and uh and Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenfall articles. So we'll we'll get back into how do the to the stars guys also have some confidential footage like how did they even if that stuff was confidential or classified, those actual Navy plane recordings, how did they get them? Why are they able to put them out? That kind of contributes to the messiness. And uh, I want to I want to come back and tell an actual story that came out with uh, with Lou's revelations from this week that I think goes the other direction and lends a little more credibility back to things. Cool, which they could use it. Is difficult. Um, <laughs> yeah, they could use it. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll be right back in a second and we'll tell you a, a pretty weird story. <laughs> we're back. You were going to tell me about some pilots seeing some shit. Well, yeah, I you, I, you you said it best when when we when we broke was that uh, in all this mess we we could use some credibility and and the credibility I think does partially come from uh, the fact that this this news story being on um, on the cover of the New York Times, uh, these reporters did a lot of their due diligence to get some comment or at least affirmation of the reality of uh, the program that Lou refers to as being a real thing. Um, And in the process of their due diligence of researching this, they hunted down one of the stories that Lou was apparently able to disclose. And again, for what reason some of these videos and stories got disclosed or declassified? Because one of the things that Two months after he worked there. (laughs) And one of the things they talk about is that you know, in terms of legitimizing these videos and documents that they have and claim they have a, quote, shitload more of, according to Tom DeLong, uh, one of the things that they, they've said a few times to try and legitimize that is that they have a chain of custody for these videos and documents, meaning that there is no possibility that they've been altered in any way and that they are indeed originally from where they say they are from which usually is or never is the case with these types of photos and videos. Right. So anyway, how if, if that does anything for you. How sway? What the fuck was that? <laughs> That's still my question in all of this. Aliens. Because you see a weird thing doesn't mean it's aliens. Well, it, maybe me, the Chinese are just on some other other shit that we don't know about yet. Let me let me tell you this story and then we'll have that conversation because I agree that that's a conversation that needs to be had. I wanted to ask a few more questions just to get to a few more sounders. <laughs> Carry on then. <laughs> yes, I'm 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 ready to be your pawn in soundboard. That's, that's okay. <laughs> gamedom. I'll, I'll let it happen naturally. <laughs> okay, great. I'm sure it will be only <laughs> slightly naturally. <laughs> So one of the stories that they dug up was uh, was another video that is uh, quickly being referred to as uh, the Nimitz incident. Um, Ooh, sounds sexy. I guess it's a sexy name. Anytime you put incident at the end of something. Oh sure, got it. Um, and that is because the uh, the two jet pilots uh, in in this story. Um, uh, Commander, let's see, um, I got their full names here. Uh, Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slate. Uh, they were on a routine training mission in their uh, F, let's see, FA 18F Super Hornets uh, and had departed from the USS Nimitz itself. Uh, which what is, is the Nimitz? The Nimitz is an aircraft carrier oh. uh, based out of San Diego. 
Okay. So they're running a routine training mission. They're 100 miles out into the Pacific Ocean, and uh, they get a radio call from the USS Princeton, which is another Navy cruiser somewhere in the area, asking if they were carrying live weapons. <laughs> Which is probably okay. not a call you're super psyched to get. Uh, hey, do you guys have live weapons on board? You might need them. Uh, was Wouldn't sort of always? the tone. Uh, no, not on training missions. Oftentimes they have fireable missiles, but are not loaded with charges on on the off chance that someone deploys something hmm. that they didn't mean to or need to. I watched the episode of The Simpsons last night where Homer joins the Navy Reserve. I don't think I've seen that episode. Well, you should check it out. Where are you going through The Simpsons on? You've been uh, given some good Simpsons references lately, which means you're going through the backlog, I know. Oh, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, FXX bought the rights to stream all of them a few years ago. Okay. And so... So anywhere, you just, like, record them on TV or what? No, if you have uh, any Comcast-related cable, they're all on, on demand, and I'm sure they're in other places, too. They were all online for free for a long time. They might yeah. still be. Okay, I'll dig. Um. So into the cockpits of their FA-18s, a radio operator on the USS Princeton informed them that they'd been tracking a mysterious craft for two weeks now. Continuously? On and off for two weeks. Okay. The object appeared suddenly at 80,000 feet. That's too high. Pretty high up. Hurtled towards the sea. That's too low. <laughs> Stopped at 20,000 feet and hovered, and then either dropped further towards the water out of radar range or shot straight back up into the sky. Wait, so they, they tracked it from 80,000 down to 20,000 and then lost it after that? And then it and then it either it did one or the other. It either went down or went all the way up, but they lost it after that jump. Okay. But they had it in radar for that for a period of time. So we may have had a USO. Uh, Submerged. Oh, interesting. Possibly, yeah. Although the initial sighting of it was at eighty, right? But there, there, there are lots of stories out there about UFOs that either in originate out. from or enter into bodies of water. Sure. Um, but Commander Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Slate gave similar accounts of this sort of this up down uh, motion that occurred. Okay. What? No, no, just. Did they say what this thing looked like at all, or was it? Only, did they ever have visual contact with it, or was it just the radar signal? They did have visual contact with it. What did it look like? Um, so, interestingly enough, this is a term that is used by service members called Tic Tacs. Yeah, I heard about that. Tic Tacs is what they call these types of UFOs, and the reason they call them Tic Tacs is because with plain eyesight, they appear to be so silverish or reflective they're almost white Mm -hmm. they have what they refer to this is apparently the parlance of people who fly planes no flight surfaces which means like no wings wings or tail fins yeah yeah, yeah. exactly Um, no visible sense of propulsion which is essentially uh, no plumes so no plumes of smoke or heat or anything like that being seen by infrared stuff Exactly. Uh, No visible wings or no visible rotors that are spinning or turning or whatever. Yeah. Um, And then often these Tic Tacs, which they call them Tic Tacs also because they're long and thin. They look like a white Tic Tac? Yeah, like, you know, kind of rectangular, elongated. Um, Often hover in locations, dart into other locations with incredible velocity, and then often leave sight with the exact same velocity that they came into sight with. So this article is laying out this story and also there's a video of it. Is that correct? There's also a video of it. Yes. Of so, this exact incident that you're describing? Correct. Okay. Near San Diego. It is in the article. If The article that I am telling the story from is titled Two Navy Airmen and an Object That Quote Accelerated Like Nothing I've Ever Seen. And it's on the New York Times. It's the second most article read on the New York Times today. So it's getting a lot of love. Um, basically these guys have a continued erratic back and forth interaction with, uh, with these, um, or with this Tic Tac object Mm -hmm. and, um, the fighter jets conferred with the, the folks on the USS Princeton and were like, what should we do here? It's not really doing anything. It keeps bouncing around. We don't really know what to do. And they said, film it and send it to Tom. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Um, 
they said, let's, why don't you rendezvous over here at this cap point? They call them, it's a 60 mile away location or it's like, get out of there, come over here and let's kind of like did meet you, back up. Did you say cat point? Cap point. Oh, okay. Cap, 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 I don't cap, know what that means either, cap, but cap, I guess point. it's a little less weird. Cap, cap, point. Um, so they go, okay, sounds good. They start heading to that point 60 miles away and the radio operator called in to both of the pilots and said, Sirs, you won't believe it, but that thing is already at your cap point. Ooh. So it told them where to go, and on radar, they tracked this thing 60 miles away. It beat them to that location. Commander Fravor, How much time had elapsed? Commander Fravor said, quote, We were at least 40 miles away, and in less than a minute, this thing had already arrived at our des- designated cap point. So they're saying it went 60 miles in roughly a minute? Yep. It's pretty damn fast. Mile a, mile a second. Right. Um, by the time the two fighter jets arrived at the rendezvous point, the object had then disappeared. However, if it's just a white, nondescript looking rounded rectangle, you don't know that there's only one of them, right? Maybe, well, maybe there's a second one. Potentially, but they didn't see it happen. The The guys who were tracking this thing on radar were the ones who tracked it from their location to the cat point that beat them there. Oh, they had radar on it the whole time? Yeah, the guys on the USS Princeton who were tracking it on radar were the ones who told them it beat them there to the cat point that they had designated. But that doesn't necessarily mean they had a signal on it the entire time in between, Right. I guess not necessarily Cause, cause no. Could but you the, even track something moving a mile a second on radar? I don't know. I don't. I don't know nearly enough about how radar works to know that that like when the beeps yeah. give off or whatever. But yeah, I mean, I guess ostensibly something else could have gone up or come down or or landed in that location. But but weird enough that they designated that as a place for something to show up, and then at that point something else showed up on the radar forty mile while they were still forty miles away on radar. Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying. to... I don't really get the the leap to that it seems like it's being implied, if not explicitly stated, the leap to extraterrestrials. So I'll read one last one last quote, and then we'll absolutely get into that. The Fravor in, in the interview said, "I have no idea what I saw. It had no plumes, no wings, no rotors, and it outran f eighteens. I don't know what it is, but I want to fly one." So. I, I understand the concept of being like, well, maybe it's some technology, right? Like maybe it's a technology that we don't understand, but I think... It wouldn't w- even have to necessarily be technology. We literally have no idea what that is. Well... I guess we can say it's a solid object probably because it showed up on radar. It's a solid object that showed up on radar and was physically observed by two separate individuals in two separate flying craft. And it, there's video of it. I mean, you can watch the video of this thing. Right. I'm just saying no no one knows what that is. And I don't think it being extraterrestrial is any more likely than any other possible answer. Well, it. I mean, I think it because it defies all of our understandings of how physics works, that's why people go to that place is saying it's an object that is physically moving in space, trackable by both radar and human eye, and... It's nothing anyone via radar or human eye has ever recognized as being an object that could or should do those types of things, which makes it seem otherworldly. Yeah, except lots of things would seem that way if you observe them before they were popularly or commonly known. Well, sure, but I guess I'm saying... There's stuff we use every day that would have seemed impossible or otherworldly otherworldly not very long ago. Yeah, no doubt. We have somewhere on our list of what-if ideas for the show, like what if you give a laptop to someone in the 1800s? Like, yeah, they'd probably probably lose their fucking minds. It would be insane to them. Yeah, and it wouldn't even have to be that extreme. Like, we're just saying this thing moves faster than we think things should be able to move. But that's like but, saying, but by what? but by a lot, not not by like it's not like sure. oh that race car drives faster. It's like by many orders of magnitude faster than any object we've ever seen in the history of humanity. Right, but look at even something as simple as like USB three compared to USB one. Well, right, but again, we we have an understanding of what those things are because they exist. Like sure. we have something to compare saying, I, something to. I'm just saying I don't think the the leap to I don't understand it, therefore it's extraterrestrial is just nonsense. Well, 
the I I don't think it is. I mean, I think I think the idea that the idea that it it is potentially from somewhere else is because it is entirely undocumented here. Right, but we have no And it's un and it's unnatural in its it's not like an animal we've never seen before. We go, oh yeah, well, if we find a lizard in the jungle we've never seen before, we just go, that's a lizard we've never found before. But if there's an object that is capable of flight and speeds of flight that are insane to our human understanding of like the laws of physics, you know, like that's the other thing. It breaks the laws of physics. It breaks the laws of propulsion. It breaks our- What, what laws of physics is it breaking by going really fast? By going from 80,000 feet to 20,000 feet. If there were anything piloting that, it would be crushed under its own weight or crush Maybe anything piloting, piloting it. piloting it. No, I'm we saying drones? The, the actual entity itself would be crushed under the weight of going that fast from 80,000 feet to 20,000 feet know, in seconds. We don't seconds. even know what it's made out of. We don't, but I'm, I mean, any, again, anything that we have going from 80,000 feet to 20,000 feet, we, we don't have things that start and stop and do those things. If, right. my, I guess what I'm trying to say is if a pilot says, I have no familiarity with this, I cannot, I cannot attribute this to anything that's ever flown before. It's doing things that the way that we understand propulsion to work as a society, things cannot do darting left and right, back and forth, up and down. That then says, hey, China, do you guys have that technology? Because we've never seen it before. And China goes, no, we have a program to investigate this stuff too. And Russia goes, yeah, no, we have a program to investigate this stuff too. This shit's crazy. Then And everyone goes, okay, cool. So if we didn't do it, who the fuck is doing that thing? Then the, then the assumption leads you to, did somebody else do it? Because we're fucking not doing it. And that's right. why people also, get to that point. I mean, I'm not saying we, we governments haven't lied about their technology before. Right. Of we course. wouldn't tell China or Russia about secret aircraft we were working on. Obviously. Of course not. And this does go back to our Area 51 conversation where we were talking about the concept of testing things that we had never seen before. Things that were rotoring and hovering and shaped weird and looked weird and moved faster and, you know, testing all of the most advanced jets and drones and things that we'd ever had as a society. All of that happened at Area 51 and we denied that any of that was happening for an extended period of time until we then released that technology to the public later on. I just also have, like, when when you talk about, well, we don't know anything that could do that. You know what we know even less about? You know what we know literally nothing about? Potential extraterrestrial life. So to say that because we don't know what it is, it must be that is just asinine because we know literally nothing about alien life. We don't even know if it's if it exists. So to attribute something to that is no more logical than saying like the gods did it. That's the same thing. Well, it which is fine if you want to take that approach, but like that's not very logical to me. I mean, I guess I would say I would say it's not asinine because I think that it would be it would be the equivalent of you know, it would be the equivalent of um coming home one day and there's like a bird flying around your house and you had never bought a bird before and you'd left all your windows closed and you said like, honey, did you buy a bird? And she's like, no, did you buy a bird? And you're like, no, I didn't buy a bird. And then you're like, okay, well, but there's a bird in the house. So like, how'd the bird get here? Cause there's definitely a bird here. You know what I mean? I didn't follow that at all. You're saying aliens put a bird in your house? Did they? I'd be a sweet bird. <laughs> it's a reptilian. I guess the point I'm trying to make is if, if we can't attribute to anything that we understand here, then the idea that people are led to, I think in an, in a semi-logical step of thought is that did it come from somewhere else then? Because nothing here as an observable phenomena has ever had the same or even remotely similar characteristics to this thing. But and that's assuming that we know about and understand everything that there is right now at this moment, which is absolutely not true. Totally understand that. And that's, and that's definitely true. But it that also... That line of thinking has been proven false over and over and over throughout history. Right. So, okay. So then, so then what you have to posit is it's probably Earth technology then that is just greater than anything we understand. Or, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think there's even a convincing argument necessarily that it's technological in this case. You saw a white object moving quickly. That's it. Uh, and, and we're basing this mostly on people's accounts of it. Well, video, radar, and two eyewitnesses. 
Yeah, but I mean, watch the video. It's, it's in no way conclusive about what that thing is. Okay, but if you would have video radar and two eyewitnesses right, but seeing just, a thing moving... A thing moving, right. That's right. all we can conclusively say is we saw a thing moving. So, but you're saying it's not a thing? I'm saying you don't have to... It's not absolutely true or it doesn't have to inherently be a man-made thing. Okay, so if it's not a man-made thing, then what is it? I, we don't know. That's my whole point. Okay, but logically then, if you're saying it's not a man-made thing, then what would you what what next would it be then? We don't know. That's the whole point. Right. Unidentified flying objects. Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah. So but the but the underlying the undertone of all of this is therefore it came from another planet. Not necessarily. That's what Tom DeLong is going to say. Yeah. Tom DeLong is going to say it's a warp drive in a vehicle that's getting it from whatever, whatever. Right. Commander Fravor says, I have no idea what I saw, but it had no plumes, no wings, and no rotors, and it outran F-18s, but I want to fly one. And I'm saying let's investigate on that level. For sure. I think that's exactly what everyone else is doing. I think Lou and the Man, two... Man, it doesn't seem like it. Not the two the stars people, but let's not let that's them... That's where all this the, is coming from. Well, it's coming from Lou. Who works for who? Now he works for them, but for yeah. nine years he worked for the Pentagon. Right, but none of this came out then. Well, right. I mean, I'm sure, but okay. So, but here, then here's the other thing. What? What? I, I genuinely do have to like. I want to know the question. How does Lou quit? And two months later, his fucking hippy dippy experiment with a fucking sort of too far gone former pop punk singer get to release and declassify UFO videos. Like how does that actually happen? And that's not, did he take them with him on a thumb drive and he just put no. them out and they're not going to arrest him? Accor well, according to Tom, they have permission to do all of this because they are essentially contracting with different governmental agencies to distribute and disseminate this information to the public because he is the best qualified person to do so. That is obviously bullshit. I would agree. That's so their then, official line, though. But then what? So if that's not true, what happens? Yeah, because it's because that's obviously bullshit. There's so no way that someone looked declass at Tom DeLonge's crazy ass and was like, "You're the man to take it to the people." <laughs> stuff gets declassified all the time. Yeah. Usually we don't hear about it. Usually it's not in the press. But it's Is usually it possible done in an that official they, way. Sure, but a lot of times that's just posting a PDF or posting a image file on the CIA or the some .gov website somewhere. Right, but I'm with saying no that fanfare would, of any kind. Totally, but that would make me way more comfortable than it being like sort of leaked through like a weird organization that just came out. What I'm getting at is maybe it was set to be declassified anyway, and Lou knew that and took advantage of that with, okay, we as to the stars are going to run with this as our story because I have some maybe privileged knowledge about this, the time and date of when things will be declassified. Yeah. And so once something is declassified, anybody can do anything with it. It's public. Right. And so maybe they're fronting as like, look, this is the special thing we have when really it would have been posted somewhere deep on a dot gov anyway. Yeah, I, I don't. Know. I mean, I'm obviously just totally guessing, but yeah, I mean, like I, I feel like in terms of, well, in terms of everything, in terms of the acknowledgement to the program itself, like we, Blue Book was supposed to be the last version of this. There hasn't been a supposed to be. I mean, like in terms of what was publicized, sure. it was supposed to be the last version of this. So the government hasn't acknowledged that they've been even addressing or or even thinking about UFOs for forty years. They acknowledge, yes, that they have been doing that. In the same time span, two videos from that program that were investigated were also released. Plus, an interview with two a commander and a lieutenant commander who have, a, a, I would say, a relatively credible story that with the radio, the video, and their actual visuals, something happened. Sure. Like, they have a story that something happened there. And that all comes out in the course of basically a day and now every major publication in the United States, like literally the New York Times, Politico, the Washington Post, Dig, QZ, everyone Everybody is talking took about- a full 48 hours off of talking about impeaching our president. Yeah, I guess there's that. I mean, we, we could talk about that angle. 
I, I don't know. I mean, there. Who knows? I, no, I know. I'm, I'm just. I'm just saying. It's. It seems. It seems super sus to me. It seems like that. That level of information and distribution of that information seems. I will say borderline coordinated in some weird way. Sure, and according to them, it is a slow start to our government disclosing that they know a lot about and have known for decades about aliens and UFOs and extraterrestrials and extraterrestrial technology. And I mean, that's clearly to the stars is narrative here. Sure. Is that the government knows about this stuff and now we know about this stuff and we're going to do it for the public good. And, but the government's also good because please don't kill us. I, I don't know. The, the whole disclosure thing has always been, strange to me in that I don't really understand what the motivation would be to disclose or to, or to not to, to not disclose for 70 years or whatever people think it's been. And then to flip at some point, what, if you had decided if, you know, say at Roswell, you realized that extraterrestrials existed and they were visiting earth you decide to keep that information secret for 70 years. And right. then because some doofus and his his paid retired military guys come knocking, right. you totally flip. Or because Stephen Greer's making a documentary, you flip. <laughs> like what Yeah. That just seems impossible to me. No, I agree. I agree. I mean, I guess in some ways, you know, the the process of declassification is is time based, right? I mean, the the for the most part, the earlier stuff is, the more we know about it, and over time, we continue to trickle more information out about earlier and earlier time periods. You know, every every ten years, stuff from fifty years previous to that ten years kind of comes out. Yeah, except for all the stuff that doesn't that we'll never know about. You no, know? of course, of course. But again, this one is weird because it's just this random guy saying. Hey, Pentagon, acknowledge the fact that I worked on UFOs for five years at the Pentagon from 2007 to 2012, which is relatively recent. And they went, yeah, that did happen. Yeah. Like, that's weird. The whole thing to me is super messy, and I don't but, understand it, uh, and it irks me. <laughs> again, in in all those acknowledgments and in that Times article and then every reposted version of that article, there's not a word about extraterrestrials. It's no, no. we see stuff and we have a documented history of seeing stuff that we don't know what it is. Right. No, completely. And I think that's the, you know, the, like if you, if you read the, uh, the article that I was just telling the story from the two Navy airmen one. And if you read, uh, the other one, there are only, there are only two uses of the words aliens and one of them is to say that bigelow said he was absolutely convinced that aliens exist in the new york times article and a uh a photo quote using that same quote that's the only and, use of like people talking about extraterrestrials i think the story more so of what the times is digging up is in a lot of ways <clears throat> excuse me in a lot of ways the fact that this was worth the government throwing money at as recently as five years ago somehow lends credence to the reality of the fact that UFOs are real and that a lot of people have reported seeing UFOs for a long period of time and have been considered fucking kooks and laughing stocks and idiots and all these things. And the fact that a senator and a bunch of like high ranking people, 30 year vets of the Pentagon, uh, Navy airmen, et cetera, all these people are coming out and talking about this thing and saying, this is just something we put money into, something we put time into, we put research into, et cetera. Regardless of what it is or where it comes from, it lends credence to a lot of the backlog of these stories. It, lend, it says, you might have also seen something. Not all of them, but but the idea that it isn't like seeing a UFO isn't just for crazy people is somehow legitimized yeah. by our government's investment in time and energy and man hours and senators and and, and accounts of Navy airmen and videos, et cetera. It no, somehow I, legitimizes I the whole thing. I obviously think it's worth looking into. I just think it's uh, the way it's being presented is extremely odd. Oh, God, it's and the weirdest. 
It's the weirdest. If I mean, the only way to maybe rationalize the like, well, yeah, we see things and we don't know what they are, but don't worry about it. Because like, that's also the the undertone is like, and it's nothing to worry about. Well, so then is that a step along the road to disclosure in, in an alien sense of like, yeah, they know, but they're not telling us yet. So they're going to ease us into it with like, well, there are, there is stuff out there that we don't really know what it is. Right. And then later they'll be like, well, maybe we know what it is. And then later, well, maybe we know what it was in the fifties. Right. I, I, I guess the, the quote that I thought was interesting was, uh, well, two things. One, if you look back at the title of it, Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program was the name of the program. Which to me implies we think another country is doing weird shit in our airspace. Or just saying in some capacity, this is a threat to us. Well, sure. Things what, flying around that you don't, that you know, don't know what know they about are or is, is potentially threatening. threatening. Yeah. Another thing that Lou talked about that I find interesting is that these, uh, these sightings that they studied over the course of his time with the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program were most often seen near nuclear bases and nuclear-powered ships and vessels, which is a thing that he talks about, and it's something we've talked about on the show before, about nuclear warheads and nuclear launch sites and all those things. I don't know. He just, that's what he said. And then a final yeah. quote where he said, someone asked him about the use of the word threat, and, he, and Lou responded, they did not exhibit overt hostility but something unexplained is always assumed to be a potential threat until we are certain it isn't. On the bright side, I believe we are closer than ever before in our understanding of how it operates. So yeah. he's not saying much about that. He just Fuck says all that language, though. Like they, <laughs> we're not sure about how it operates. Like, yeah, are you trying to tell us something or not? Do you know anything or not? But it, but is that also part of it? Right? Is is part of it to? legitimize it and then also instantly but legitimize, delegitimize it by asking They're not even questions. Saying what? The phenomena, the concept of how can you legitimize something that you can't name? Well, you you legitimize it by saying we study it, we've seen it, we document it, we have videos of it. And yet we know absolutely nothing. We're closer to knowing. Yeah, like that's not both those things are not possible. Well, it is possible. Of course it's possible. That you've spent 70 years studying something and don't know anything about it. Uh, of course but they, you're not worried about it. But you're also going to keep studying it? That doesn't I mean, make any sense. But it also goes right back to what we were talking about, about they're not going to actually, if they know something. That's what I'm saying. They're not yeah. going to tell us. Right. So fuck all of this. <laughs> <laughs> That's honestly kind of my opinion at the end of the, like, okay, great. Like, yeah, I didn't think that millions of people had hallucinated seeing things in the, in the sky or in the water or wherever. Sure. So you're telling me that a bunch, not all of those people are liars. Okay, great. That doesn't tell me anything. And the fact uh, that somebody in the military saw it honestly it does. doesn't do much to legitimize it for me. I think it does for a lot of people. Sure. I'm speaking for myself right now. No, I know. But I'm just saying, I think I can understand why it's crushing the media right now. No, no. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying it's fucking frustrating Yeah, because you're at the same time, not giving me any information about anything. Right. And I don't know why you're giving me this little tease of information. And I'm assuming that there's some agenda behind it. Because right. there always is. It, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I also assume that you're lying to me about parts of it because you always are. Yeah. Or withholding parts or whatever. Yes. And then you got fucking Tom DeLonge fucking involved Tom for some DeLong. reason. You guys. Who I don't think knows... It what the fuck he's talking about 90% of the time, but then 10% of the time he probably does. And he has <laughs> a huge platform know. to say both. Yeah. yeah. You guys, I think part of Spencer's like deep seated sense of frustration right now is that he just really is like, am I any closer to getting abducted or not? Honestly. <laughs> Cause he wants it so bad. <laughs> just like, fuck out of here with your blurry videos. And you're, well, we saw some stuff, but we can't say, like, Spencer's like, if it's real, come and get me, God damn it. Well, if you've been studying it for 70 <laughs> years, you have better, you have better evidence than one kind of blurry black and white video of a fucking Tic Tac. Get the fuck out of here. I think it's interesting. It is, it's but it's fucking frustrating. It is. It is. It is. It totally is. It's like all of those a, ghost hunter paranormal shows that at the end they'll say, well, I guess we still don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. This is definitely. This is. But uh, okay. Here, I, I'll say. Here's what I'll say. It, it's. 
it's frustrating in the sense that it's sort of like dangling a carrot, right? Like it's it's you know the the whole concept of the horse with the like the carrot on the stick on the string. No, ex- explain this. Uh, explain your analogy to me further, please. Okay, so <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> so wait, you're saying horses eat carrots? Shut the fuck up. <laughs> so so it's the concept of dangling a carrot on a stick, right? And it's no, like I don't get it. shut the fuck up. And, and I feel like we. As a society, that's part of the reason that it's crushing in the media, right? Is everyone's going, oh, interesting, I want more of that. But it's intentionally held far enough away that you're not actually really getting anything out of it. But in that case, there's a reason for doing it. You want the horse to run. What what do you what is the reason here? Do they want do, do they want people to run towards that? And it goes back to what you just said. For what reason? I mean, yes. Look what we're talking about right now. Look what a bunch of news. Yeah, but for what reason? Well. For for ad revenue for the times? Maybe. Is it to get us to stop talking about the other things that are pretty hot in the news right now? Uh, yeah. If 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 the government doesn't like how the government's being talked about in public spaces, would the government potentially put out government information so that of course. people start talking about other government things and not other government things? Of course. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. Disinformation. <laughs> Spencer and I are fucking pissed and we love you guys and we're sorry. <laughs> we're sorry that we're pissed and we love you. Oh no. We haven't hit a soundboard in 45 minutes because we've been fucking oh, mad about the space. So many lies were born. <laughs> a dick move. There. I think I got all of them. We caught up. All right, guys. Uh, that's going to do it for this week on the What It Podcast. As always, we don't have any fucking answers for you guys, but we have a lot more questions. Um, we want to know. Have been hooked with <laughs> bamboozle, led astray, run amok, and flat out deceit. This whole bang, episode could have been just six seconds long. Oh uh, yeah, we could have, or just that over and over and over again. Uh, we want to know what you think. Uh, hit us up at hi at whatifpodcast dot com. We've been getting some amazing emails over the past couple of weeks. Thank you to everybody who's been sending emails in. Uh, a ton more new Patreon subscribers came on this week. For those that don't know, there's like 14 additional episodes of the podcast uh, that you on this show haven't heard if you're not a Patreon subscriber. So go get those 14 plus a new one every single week uh, at patreon.com slash what it podcasts if you would like it's only five bucks a month and you get four extra episodes every single month wow blow we love you guys and uh, we'll be back right after Christmas with a special fun weird episode uh, that I think you guys are gonna like a lot and we'll sing you Christmas carols or some shit love you bye we'll be back next week with another episode of the what if podcast Learn more at www.whatifpodcast.com.